It's good to see everyone out, despite a little bit of white stuff on the roads and that kind of stuff. Um, but that's what I guess we can expect for November. Uh, I'm looking forward to this evening, to hearing the reports and the message from God's Word. But to begin with, I'd just like to read a portion of Scripture. Uh, from Matthew chapter 13. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds. As he scattered them across his field, some seeds, seeds fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on shallow soil and with underlying rock. The seeds sprouted quickly because of the, the soil was shallow, but the plant soon wilted under the hot sun, and since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Other seeds fell among thorns that grew up and choked out tender plants. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as had been planted. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. As we go through this weekend, I think we're going to be hearing about some of those different soils. Um, and the effectiveness of God word, God's word in all of those areas. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that we can gather together uh, in freedom uh, to hear about your word and, and to hear and see about how you are working in this world. And as we do that, may we be touched and encouraged about your sovereignty and your power as you work. Thank you for uh, that message of salvation that you've given each one. And I pray that uh, as we go from here, we would be encouraged to spread that to all those around us. pray this in your name. Amen. Abe, uh, why don't you come lead us in a song? Normally, I'd invite you to... Turn in your hymn books, but we don't have hymn books. But uh, I will um, invite you to stand if you like and join in. You know, David, we changed the order of the songs. Could you put the other one up? I'm sorry, I didn't tell you. I, I told our pianist, so she knows. Take the name of Jesus with you. And that's, that's what we want to do as we go even from here to our homes and our workplaces. So we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Take 
This evening we have the pleasure of having Ryan Rempel here uh, from Give the Word Ministries. How many of you remember him speaking in this church? How many of you picked up a Bible that he offered you to take and share? <laughs> okay. It was a blessing to have that. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, I gave mine out. I haven't seen seed from it, but... I, I was faithful in doing that, and it was a, a joy to do that. Ryan, come share about what you're doing at Give the Word. Good evening. Um, I'm excited to be here. Uh, I love the opportunity to be able to talk about what uh, God is doing with Give the Word. Um, the Word is... is so, so incredibly alive, um, especially in a season, um, especially in this season. It's been, it's been absolutely amazing to watch Give the Word grow and flourish over the last couple of years. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, Give the Word is a ministry that donates uh, Bibles for min ministries and individuals to use for outreach and evangelism uh, across Canada and beyond. Um, so, on average, um, you know, if, if we're talking numbers, we, we typically donate around 60,000 Bibles a year. Um, this year it's looking more about 80,000 Bibles a year. Um, Give the Word has just exploded over this past year and a half, and uh, I couldn't be more grateful for what God is doing um, with this ministry. COVID has definitely... Uh, change the, the demographic of where Bibles are going. Um, you know, there's not as many, you know, churches ordering Bibles. Um, there's not as many Bible camps and stuff like that ordering Bibles. Um, but the demographic that we've seen a huge increase in is those who now have the time and opportunity to share their faith, who are wanting resources to do that with, um, as well as people who aren't even believers who are contacting us online, finding us online going, I'm in a place right now where I'm asking questions. Do you have something um, that I could read that would answer some of these questions that I have about faith? Uh, so it's been really, really cool to see that demographic increase. Uh, and then watching some of the stories that, uh, that we get back from that has just been absolutely mind-blowing. Um, we, uh, we have a warehouse in Winnipeg, and now we have a brand new warehouse uh, in Steinbeck. Um, which allows us to stock about 150,000 Bibles at a time, um, which is uh, amazing because we, we go through them all. And, uh, and so we have some amazing trucking companies on board that, uh, that are doing all of our shipping for us for free. And it's uh, what a godsend to be able to uh, have this brand new space for us to work out of. Um, I was reminded today of a, of a fellow who had called us... Uh, this is probably about a month ago now. He is, uh, he's from Calgary. Uh, he's a mechanic. He had called me up one day. I've never chatted with him before. And, and he just said, hey, he said, I just wanted to share with you something. Um, he said, a while back, uh, somebody gave, had given me um, one of your Bibles. And he said, I was in a state where I was completely, completely broken. I've, I lost everything to my addictions. Um, uh, my business was failing. Everything was failing. Um, and I was at a point in my life where I really, wanted, had, really didn't want to have anything to do with God. Uh, but somebody gave me this Bible, and I started to read it. And it was just like every single word was just jumping off this page. It was like as if it was written specifically for me. Um, and he said, I just I couldn't put it down. He said, Mike, you should see my Bible now. There's not a page on there that isn't marked up. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that, uh, that I'm over eight months clean and uh, I found the Lord, and, uh, and I can't stop sharing the gospel. And so I found your contact information on the back of this Bible, and I'm wondering if you can start supplying me with resources that I can start sharing with my coworkers and my friends and my family. Uh, and he said, my business has taken off again, and I'd, I'd like to come on board as a supporter of your ministry. So it's, 
whoa. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was an amazing phone call. Um, and those stories are plenty. Um, we get them in almost daily through via Facebook Messenger, through you know, letters in the mail, through emails. It's absolutely amazing uh, to watch God's Word transforming lives and, and start bringing fruit. And, and for all these little pockets of missionaries to be coming up all over, all over Canada, it's pretty exciting. Uh, there was another lady, um, her name is Jay, and uh, we were able to give her her very first Bible in our, in our office. Um, she was... Uh, she was an addict. Um, she was living a homosexual lifestyle. Uh, it was the story. I won't go into her story, but it's it's a mess. Um, and she got saved uh, over this past year, and uh, she is now so on fire for the Lord. And and so we got to give her her first Bible, and and now about once every three weeks, she's in our office picking up more, going, "I'm out." here's my stories, here's what happened, can I get more? And, and uh, this last time she had brought a friend with her who was uh, um, a, a brand new believer as well. And what had happened was this lady had come into her, this lady Jay owns a, a salon. And so this lady had come into the salon and uh, she had noticed this Bible sitting on one of her shelves. And it just said story of God on it. She didn't know it was a Bible. She said, what is that book? And she said, uh, that's a Bible. And she goes, huh. She goes, I was, I've been thinking over the last couple of days that I really, really want to start hearing more about who God is. She said, I have no idea who he is, but I have this void in my, in my heart that's just asking questions, and I have no answers. And uh, so she had given uh, this lady this book, and, uh, and she got saved um, so she's now coming into our office, picking up more Bibles and sharing stories with us. And one of the stories that she shared was that she was at this uh, get-together at a friend's house. And um, there's, uh, they were talking, she had gotten into this conversation about some guy there about tattoos. They both have tattoos. And, and uh, this guy was talking about this very sinister tattoo that he wanted to get on his back. And it was... Uh, it's a horribly evil tattoo. I won't, I won't even say what it is because it's, it's awful. But anyways, this, uh, this lady started telling him um, about Jesus. And this guy was just like, man, I've always kind of wondered about that. I've never really... They got into this massive conversation and she ended up giving this guy a Bible. And uh, three weeks later, he accepted the Lord. And now he's wanting more resources and, and a Bible that has more questions and answers. And he's just... He's right into the word, and it's, uh, it's such a privilege to be able to do this every single day. Um, sometimes it feels like a mundane job. Sometimes it feels like I have a warehouse job where I'm stuck in the warehouse, you know, shipping out orders, bringing stuff in, uh, and then it's that email that we get at the end of the day um, or that Facebook message we get that just goes, oh, this is why we do it, and uh, what a joy it is to be able to do it. Um, one of the largest projects that we worked on uh, this past year was um, a Bible specifically for Pregnancy Care Canada. Um, you may have heard about this project already, I'm not sure. Um, but this lady had come into our office and she was talking about her heart for reaching out to women facing unplanned pregnancies. And she asked, do you have a Bible that specifically caters to that demographic? And uh, I just said, yeah, no, there isn't really anything like that out there. Um, but we can give you, you know, some other Bibles. And, and so she picked up a few Bibles, but she said, let me know if something like that ever comes up. He said, because this is a Bible that's greatly needed. Uh, and I know there are many ministries who would have a use for it. And so after my conversation with her, I thought, well, why can't we just make one? Let's just make one. All it takes is people and money and... God's got all that. So <laughs> and so uh, I started to explore what that could look like. And so I had contacted Jurgen Severlo, who is the director for the Winnipeg Crisis Pregnancy Center. And I, he's a friend, of mine, a friend of mine. And I just said, you know, if there was a Bible that catered to the demographic that you serve with testimonies and stories of women sharing their 
story of how they kept their baby in the middle of, you know, a turbulent circumstance, or women who have maybe had abortions in the past but found forgiveness and, and hope and salvation through Christ, um, as well as all the helps that you guys offer in your pregnancy care centers, all encompassed in a Bible, would you have a use for that? And he's like, oh, he goes, that would be a miracle if there was something like that. And so I said, well, we'd like to create one with you. And so he had put me in touch with their national director, and I ended up speaking at their AGM, uh, and they were on board with it. And, uh, and so we, uh, we launched the, the You Are Loved uh, Bible Project, and uh, we had some amazing stories come in. Um, within one week, we had three women who had shared their story with me about how they had kept their baby or gave their baby up for adoption without even knowing we were doing this Bible. And I'm like, would you be willing to share your story? And they're like, yeah, that would be amazing. And, and so they collected about uh, nine different testimonies. And uh, it was about a $120,000 project that was over and above what we already had to raise for the year, which was about $400,000. So it's, uh, I didn't know how this was going to go over. But as always, I just thought, hey, if God's in it, he'll provide. If not, he won't. And uh, obviously, I was hoping that he would. And he did. Um, little did I know is the lady that, uh, that came to us to ask if we had this Bible available at the beginning, um, she was our first donor of the project. I had given her a call and said it was the conversation that you had with me that sparked this idea and now it's becoming a reality. And uh, a couple days later we had a check for $10,000 from her. We didn't know, even know who she was. And, uh, and a project that I was going to take almost a year to fundraise for was completed in uh, less than five months. And uh, it was phenomenal how it all came together. It's actually at the printers right now, and uh, it should be ready for distribution uh, within a couple of weeks. And so they'll be going to all 80 crisis pregnancy centers uh, across Canada. So uh, yeah, God's word continues to go out. Give the word continues to grow. Um, you know, God's bringing in the support uh, that we need to be able to grow. And we couldn't be more excited about what God is doing uh, with Give the Word. If somebody would have told me that this is where we would be in nine years, I would never have believed it. And uh, so I just want to thank you, uh, you know, your church uh, for supporting us. It means the absolute world uh, to have you on board. And uh, yeah, we're excited to be here. Thanks. Speaking of Bibles, let's uh, sing a couple of verses of The Solid Rock. My hope is built on nothing else. If you'd like to stand, you can. If you want to sit, that's fine too. We'll sing verses 1 and 4. You will sing the words up there.
Next, we're going to have a, a video presentation by um, Jacobo and Agonitha. Um, most of you, just looking, yeah, all of you should know who they are. Um, but here's an interesting fact that I don't know if it is exactly public. But their home church is in Mexico and they provide their total support for them to be able to minister as teachers and community impact people in Hacienda Verde. Uh, when they went to their church, a church that hadn't really been supporting missionaries a lot, but when they went and presented the work, they stood behind them. And so we feel like there are members here, and they are members, and yet their church has done that for them in Mexico. And it's, it's just been beautiful to see them grow in their work. And uh, uh, here, uh, a while back, we had, hmm, Mr. Kaler share about some of the work that they did and how they did, and it was exciting to, to get that kind of report. And so this evening, we're going to hear from them personally. Notice the lack of Benny uh, being here and being involved in every area. We still get together a lot with Esther and the kids. We enjoy their presence, that they are still here. But we also see the hurt and the pain, and we go the journey with them. And on a positive note, we just recently had our yearly AMI M retreat. And this time we decided that we would go to Cochabamba. We went there for a weekend. And so we visited the city, got to know Cochabamba a little bit better, and it was a good time just reconnecting with all of our MEM team members. They were all there, and so it was a good bonding time. We had a very good time there, and we're thankful for that. We're thankful for our MEM team. A lot of our time, or at least my time, is spent at school, whether teaching or preparing in the afternoon for the classes. And this is my second year at, at the school, although it feels like it's the first normal year. And it's been a very good year. I've enjoyed teaching this year more than more so than I did last year. And so overall, it's been a blessed year. Uh, I'm the responsible teacher for grade eight and nine. There's ten students in those two classes combined. That's why we have them combined together because they're small small classes. And so some of the things that we've been doing together with them with that class is we've invited them a few times over for a meal or for terere. And so last time we had them over for pizza night. The girls helped Aganitha bake some pizza. And so we had a good night uh, enjoying the pizza and fellowship and getting to know them outside of the classroom where it's not just about homework and doing stuff that's related to school. And our school year is coming to an end. We have only two and a half weeks left. So our graduation is planned for November 19th, and this is our first year that we have a graduation from grade 12. So we are very excited about that. There's two girls in that class. They're both our, they're, they're two sisters. They are neighbor girls. And so we are excited about the progress and the growth that is happening in school and the community. And another positive thing that is happening at school is that the school building is coming up. So we are expecting to have another school building and another six classes for next year. So that is all some of the positive things that are happening at school. I have enjoyed giving the gastronomy classes. It is done at our house and our kids are being watched during that time from the neighbor's family. It is both in practical and theory. And we do a lot of um, 
big recipes so that we can also share with our neighbors or with the other families. It has been a blessing. I've really enjoyed it. And I've enjoyed the snacks and the good food that comes out of it. And about the church and the community, the community is definitely growing. Many people are moving in here, but also some people are moving out. But the church is also growing. We have had a few baptisms this year, quite big ones. And then also membership classes and transfers. It is a blessing to see how people are joining the church and being involved. Some of the special events that we have had in church this year again is Spring Fest and also Thanksgiving. Those are events where we always get a lot of visitors from outside, people coming from the colony. And those, those are always a good time to reconnect and just share the gospel also with them and just be a light to them and enjoy a meal and fellowship together with our fellow brothers and sisters and just getting to know people from outside. And another thing that we've been doing is youth. We've been youth leaders for this year, along with another two couples and Esther as well. So we enjoy that team as well. And just being among youth, it always gives us more energy and it makes us feel like we're still young, which I think we still are. But it's been a really good year with the youth. We enjoy them. We enjoy connecting with them and yeah, just catching up with them and getting to know what's happening in their life. With a growing church and a growing community also means that there are coming a lot of challenges. And we just ask you that you will pray for wisdom always again and again. Also, when youth are coming out of the colony and they're looking for refuge here, often the community helps them a lot and then they uh, turn their back still and go back to the colony. Sometimes they stay, but that we will not get discouraged and just be the hands and feet for Jesus and help the people that are coming to seek for help. And in her personal life, Agonita still loves me, and I love her. <laughs> and we had visitors from Mexico, which was a blessing. Uh, Gilberto and his wife, Eva, were here uh, earlier in the year. And so they're the um, mission link with the church from Mexico to the MEM here. So it's been good to see them involved and be curious and asking questions about the mission here and also just encouraging people in Mexico to be a part of this. And so we had a really good time here when they came here for a, a week or so to visit us and just showing them around here in Bolivia, letting them get to know what our life is and the people here in the community. And so we were thankful to receive visitors from Mexico. We also had the opportunity to go to Paraguay. That was a very good privilege. I have been there studying for almost four years. Jacobo has never been there, so it was good to go and meet the people, see the school and the classmates and the teachers. The couple that took me in as their daughter where I got a lot of healing. It was very good to just go and reflect back on the time being there. Also, in Bolivia we notice a lot of the seasons and nature, not with snow but with dryness or wetness and right now we are in the rainy season it's very humid and we get a lot of rain right now as a family we're doing very good we are all healthy there was a time when we had quite a lot of sickness but we're doing good now thanks to god and also we're expecting our third baby for the beginning of next year and we're looking forward for that and some prayer requests as agonita mentioned already wisdom uh, wisdom as we are making decisions for the upcoming year especially with the new baby coming in our family and we've noticed this year that we've been quite busy with being involved in a lot of different areas and to some extent that is it's been a blessing but to on the other side we've also seen that it's getting quite busy as we think of of a family that is growing so we ask for prayers to make wise decisions as to where to participate and where to be a blessing and really just focus on where God wants us to be and also just to be a light as a family in the community. Thank you for your listening ears, your encouraging words and for all your prayers, your feedback on the emails, the newsletters that we send out. And yes, 
I'll just add some prayer requests about the Christmas season. I think we'll bring some programs again. And a few weddings that are quite important to us. One of my is my sister that are coming up and we will be involved with. And then for the baby. So we ask that you just pray for all of that. And come to visit us. Yes. <laughs> it was nice to talk with you. Thank you for being in contact with us. Thank you for all your support and for your friendship. Jeremiah, you want to say bye? Bye. Rochelle, you want to say bye? No. Say bye bye. Bye bye. Obviously, a busy family. And it's certainly good to hear from them. Well, it's good, my pleasure uh, to introduce my colleague to me to you. Uh, huh. Okay. Yeah, it's probably good. Now's a good time. I think you've all had an opportunity to, to read the different projects. Basically, it's helping with a radio tower in Bolivia. Uh, YFC is expanding, or building new in, in Altona. And World Serve Bible College. And I think Jorge will be kind of piecing little bits here and there throughout his time this weekend about what that all involves. Um, and we'll be splitting that up, that offering up uh, uh, for those three projects. The offering is done in your normal way. Plus, tomorrow night, uh, Abe talked about it on Sunday, but if you weren't here, there's a soup and pie auction. There's going to be about uh, 10, 12 pies and, or, and, and jars of soup that will be available, made by various people. And come, it'll happen right after Jorge's message tomorrow evening. So uh, bring your wallet for that. And uh, I, I, I've been to missions auctions, and, and they've been fun times. So uh, I'm looking forward to that as well. Tomorrow evening, again, at 7 o'clock in the evening. But men, you're invited to breakfast at 8.30. Ladies. 8.30 in the morning, <laughs> right. Uh, ladies' lunch, and I don't have a time here. 12 o'clock, okay. Uh, I would assume so, but I just confirm that. And uh, again, um, youth will be having some, I believe, pizza in the evening, so uh, all part of a, a busy Saturday, different things to do. Missing anything? Okay. Uh, now back to Jorge. His colleague he lives in Chilliwack, BC. Uh, we were just expecting him, but his son Daniel came with him, and it's been a joy to get to know him last night and today, and so that's a bonus. Uh, so if you have questions about uh, being a youth in, in La Paz, Mexico, ask him. He's open to that uh, and has done various uh, interesting things. Um, Jorge is, is an experienced man. He loves to teach. He loves people. Uh, we, I can definitely tell that he's Latino uh, in that aspect of being relational and, and loving people. But more than that, he loves God. And um, that comes out continually as you spend time with him. So, Brother Jorge, uh, come minister. Well, good evening. What a joy to be here again. It's been four years. And uh, I was counting the days because I was so blessed last time. And uh, when I heard from Lou that I was invited to be here with you, uh, I was jumping out of joy, literally, because I really, really missed you and, and got to know some of you 
uh, in a deeper level, and that was just amazing. I wasn't expecting the welcome I received last night as I was driving through the blizzard to get to Lewis House, but that didn't discourage me. Uh, all the contrary, it's like first time for a Mexican driving through a blizzard trying to find where the road is and not skidding off, and, uh, but it was fun. And, uh, and I'm sure that uh, your prayers uh, were listened and heard and, and we were taken care of. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here with you. And uh, this weekend on Total Missions, uh, we're going to uh, walk through the first two chapters in First Thessalonians and uh, in an effort of trying to see an x-ray of that church in Thessalonica and how God used them and what he did uh, with them and through them uh, in the first century and what lessons we can learn from that church uh, when we are trying to uh, get involved in missions and trying to get involved in sharing God's word. I think we're going to have very important lessons. Uh, but let's start by reading the first verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, if you have your Bible with you. 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 1 to 3, and I'll read it out for you. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to read so far. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your kindness to our lives. Thank you for allowing us to be together tonight in this place, reading your word and learning from you. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will instill in our hearts what you have for each one of us and what you have for this beautiful church. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, at the beginning of this letter, we see that it's signed by Paul, by Silvanus, and by Timothy, not only by Paul. We're used to read the Pauline letters only signed by Paul. And I don't know if you asked yourself in the past, how does a church begin? How does a church comes to be? This letter is addressed to the church of Thessalonica, and it's probably the first letter that Paul wrote back in the 50s after Jesus' uh, resurrection. But how did the uh, Thessalonians church came to be? I don't know if you ask yourself those kinds of things. I definitely do sometimes, and I think we should so that we can learn stuff like this that's important. How does a church is formed anywhere in the world? How can a Christian church be formed in the neighboring cities from where you are or the neighboring places? And I want to teach you a little bit of this as we study the church of Thessalonica because we live in a time and age where missionaries and churches appear literally under the rocks everywhere and many of them claim to be Christians and claim to be doing the work of the Lord and, and, and claim to be wanting to honor him but the problem is that many of them do not follow what the Bible says. They're doing their own thing and we have to go back to scriptures. We have to go back to the Bible. If we do not follow what God says, how can we say we are making a church that pleases God. We can't. We're doing our own thing. We have to go to his word. Uh, some of you came to this church, perhaps I'm, I'm guessing, because someone invited you, because you came to an event and you felt loved, welcomed, cared for, as I did uh, a few years ago. And somehow God allowed you to hear the message of the gospel and you get to know Christ and repented of your sins and, and began a relationship with your Savior. Um, others of you perhaps, uh, you know, have been here forever. You know, your parents were here, your grandparents were here, and the parents of your grandparents were here. And, and this is the church where, where, you, where you grew up and where you heard the gospel and, and where you have learned how to grow in godliness. But let me tell you how the church started... Uh, Altogether, you know, back at the beginning, before Pentecost, 
the disciples and the women were praying and they were waiting for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And this happened just after they spent 40 days with Jesus after he had risen. The Holy Spirit comes with power and this group of 120 people in one day becomes a group of 3,000 people. Can you imagine that? Another day, Peter is preaching, and then to that group of 3,000 people, 5,000 more people are converted to Christianity. And you go, wow. So there you have your first church. It's a group of people who want to know more about God, who believe what Jesus did because God proved it to them through Jesus' resurrection. He demonstrated his God through his resurrection, his ascension, and they are reconciled with God and free from sin thanks to Jesus' sacrifice. But how did the other churches come about? Because it wasn't the same way. Jesus had told his disciples before his ascension to heaven that they were to be witnesses, you remember, in Jerusalem? Where else? Judea? To the end of the world, right? Everywhere. Samaria. And that is part of what we know as the Great Commission. To go into all the world and make disciples. And teach them to obey what Christ has taught us. Well, if you had read the book of Acts, which is where we find the story of what happened after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You will read that the disciples were in full swing in Jerusalem. They were serving the Lord. Life was good. The church was growing daily. They're having great communion. People are learning about the love of the Father through Jesus Christ. They're, they're having fellowship. They're helping each other. They're loving each other. Everything is wonderful. The logical response in the people of the time was, if God has done this for me, if God did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for me in spite of my sin, how can I not give myself to him completely, entirely? And they began to live out Christianity. They began to truly help each other. They sold what they had. They helped those in need, those who had nothing, and they gathered to it in fellowship and pray and learn from God every day. It was such an amazing love and such an amazing brotherhood that people began to see what God was doing in these people, in these Christians, and they said, we want what they have. We want that. How come they're doing all these things? We want to be part of that. And the Bible says that every day, those who were to be saved were added to the church. Obviously, the religious leaders in Judaism were envious and they sought to destroy them. So they killed Stephen. And with the martyrdom of this wonderful young man in Acts chapter 7, it brings a deadly persecution of Christians. Now, what the persecution causes is that Christians begin to flee and they start going to neighboring places. You know where they went? To Judea. Samaria, and to the end of the world. Eventually, all the known world of the time. Look, I could tell you all the details about how all these things happen, because I'm fascinated with the story of how God did things. But I know many of you uh, are not going to appreciate that uh, and would appreciate better if I just get to the point. And uh, I want you to see a principle that we see in the book of Acts. Suddenly, because of persecution, a church is formed in Antioch, of all places. And it began because Christians shared the news with the people around them. They shared, hey, let me tell you something about Jesus. And it began to take shape. But then the apostles sent Barnabas. They said, hey, why don't you go to Antioch and take a look at this group, see what's happening there from Jerusalem. See what's going on in this new church. Barnabas goes and takes Paul with him, and they go together, and they look at this church. They established that church for several months, and they taught them, and the church grew. And it was there in Antioch where they are called for the very first time Christians. This is very interesting. The people that are not Christians, the people from the city, 
should, saw these men and they say, oh, look at those guys. They are little Christs. They are Christ-likes. They are Christians. What kind of life, what kind of behavior, what kind of witnessing were they seeing on this newborn people on a daily basis that they would call them Christians? Now, this is where we see the model for missions and the emergence of churches. Listen to what Acts chapter 13 says. Now, there were in the church in Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid hands on them and sent them off. What we have here is an established church where there is good leadership. They're praying. They're seeking God's direction. God has been maturing the members of the church. And they were already teachers and mature Christians in this particular church, then God brings a calling upon certain people. But be careful. The call is not on little Brandon. Hey, I think I want to go and travel the world and, and, and bring the gospel to Timbuktu and say, okay, little Brandon, grab your backpack. Off you go. It's not like that. Did you read what, what we just saw? They are in prayer. They are in fasting. And the Holy Spirit brings the call. And then the church, in prayer and fasting, confirms the call by laying hands on them and sending them out. Oh, this is so important. Notice the order. Number one, a call from God confirmed in fasting and prayer. Number two, the confirmation of the church of that call. And number three, be sent by the church to fulfill that call. Why is it important for you and I to learn these things? Well, because this is the model we see in scriptures. This is what we're reading in God's word. And it has many reasons why it should be done this way. Today, many people do whatever they want, however they want it. You have no idea how many people with great intentions want to do things their way instead of God's way. I live in a city where uh, there are dozens of churches uh, and they were born because the church split it. Uh, the, the pastor was the sole administrator, the sole uh, preacher, the sole decision maker, not accountable to anybody. So of course he's not protected. He falls in sexual sin or he steals money from the church. The church splits and there you have two different churches. Who's going to pastor this group? Oh. You know what? You've been here the longest. You'll be the pastor. Who's going to pastor this other group? Oh, you've been the worship leader. You'll be now the pastor. And there you have two groups out of a split or a broken beginning with very weird doctrines because they have their own concepts and ideas. And that's what they're teaching to each group. And suddenly the same story repeats over and over. And then you have not two but four and eight and 16 churches that are not rooted in the word. And you think, whoa, that's great. There's 16 churches. Yeah. What are they teaching? What are they preaching? What is the people coming to these places truly learning? Are they hearing the gospel? Listen, I'm, there are many people who truly adhere to the word of God and have great burdens and really seek to do things and find a strong wall in front of them at all times and with great strife swimming against the current are sharing the gospel in persecuted countries, in countries where their own family is against them because of what they're teaching, when they're teaching the word. But the church must always be behind because the church is the one that knows the person. The church knows whether that person that's being sent is a man or a woman with the spiritual maturity to go somewhere else and plant a church or be a missionary or share the word. 
The church has seen this young man or woman grow in the church. They've seen their struggles. They've seen their successes. They've seen how they love the Lord. They've seen their gifting in place in the church. And when that person is sent, he knows he has a family behind them that's praying for him, that's supporting him, that knows that he can count on them because back home, he has the family of God who saw him grow being sent on a mission as Jesus was sent by the Father. That's so important. If you send someone that is not prepared, you do harm to the work of God. And you do harm to the missionaries that are sent. They end up losing their marriages. They end up losing their families. They end up sick. They end up with lots of problems. All because they weren't following God's blueprints on scriptures. You see, when we think we know better, that's when we get ourselves into trouble. So let's say you're starting a church in a neighboring community or in another city or a country in the world. If your church is not sending you, how do you have credibility? How do people know that what you're saying is not just empty words or just air? If the people that know you are telling you that you're not prepared, that you're not ready, how are you going to deal with the hardships of ministry without a church behind you? You see the problem? And that's something that's happened. So I'm telling you this because it has everything to do with 1 Thessalonians. Some of the reasons why churches are in bad shape today, it's because they're not doing things God's way. And the church in Thessalonica, they start off on the right foot because Paul and his companions did things God's way. Now look, several months had passed uh, after Paul's secondary mis uh, second missionary journey. Uh, he's accompanied by Timothy and Silas and uh, he gets arrested in Philippi a lot of things happens. You can read it in Acts chapter 16. But finally, they come to Thessalonica. They begin to share the, the, the message of salvation of Christ. And I'm just going to read to you what happens in Luke 17. This is, uh, in Acts 17, this is what Luke tells us. When they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead and saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas and did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. And so began the church in Thessalonica. They were with them for some time, and once the church was established, Paul had to live and continue the calling of God on his life and ministry. And what we're going to learn through this weekend is that this church is not a static social club. It's a living organism that grows, that grows in a very healthy way, and that reproduces all over the area. It multiplies. And, and, and they sent others. And we need to do the same as Christians to expand the kingdom of heaven. I want to ask you something very important. Regardless of what stage in life you are, are you ready to be sent? Are you ready to be sent? You know there's great need. You know in India there are millions of people who die daily without knowing the message of the gospel. You know, in Africa, Asia, Europe, there are hundreds, thousands of churches who are praying for leaders, for people who would come alongside and help them in the ministry. Cuba, Venezuela, Guatemala, Peru, the Amazon, Mexico, Winkler, Plum Cooley, Morden, Selkirk. There is a great need for the gospel. Are you ready? Why did Jesus save you? Because of your pretty face? Well, that's a fact. You have a pretty face. But it's not because of that that he saved you. He saved you on a mission. 
Every single Christian, we are saved in a mission. But we have to understand how we can be of impact for the kingdom of God in the place, in the season of life where he has placed us, in the marketplace, in our families, wherever we are. Because he has given us something that angels have not experienced. Angels cannot share the message of the gospel. They won't experience salvation. The stars, the nature, it speaks about God, but they can't share the message of the gospel because only you and I have experienced salvation. We have a calling, each one of us. A few years ago, I got a, a, an email from, uh, we were planting a church in Mexico, I got an email from a young man in Canada saying like, I wanna come on missions to Mexico, can I come to La Paz? So like, okay, uh, do you speak Spanish? No. Okay. Um, so does your church know you have this calling for missions? Um, nope, they have no idea. Okay, um, what do you do in your church? Do you serve some ministry? Are you part of what the church does on a weekly basis or so? Uh, you know, I, I don't have time for that. Like I'm so busy with you know school and work and this and that. So I really don't participate in the church. I'm like, okay, um, have you shared the gospel with someone this week? Uh, no. How about this past month? This past six months? Uh, no, not really. Okay, so where's that burden for the gospel? Where's that sense of calling and loving the people to know about God? You don't know how many times I've heard people like that, that they just want to travel the world. You want to travel the world? Go work in a travel, travel agency. You're going to suffer less. I guarantee you that. And you'll get to travel the world. But you're also not going to see the joys of really being vested in what Christ has done for you. And what I'm asking is, if you're ready to be sent, get involved in your church. Get involved in your church. Get to know your brothers and sisters. I know we see each other uh, every weekend. I mean, you see your, your, your brothers. I see the people in the church I attend. But are we truly involved in their lives? How are you doing? How can I pray for you? What's happening on your daily life? Imagine this week. How many people comes to Bergfeld Church? I don't know if it's 150 or 200 people. Imagine all those people praying for you. Knowing you, knowing what you need, knowing the joys that God has given you. And they are vested in your life, which truly are the family of God. Not just brother and sister, because I forgot your name, but truly the family of Christ. Truly vested in the gospel. I don't know if I told you this story before, but in the church we uh, planted in La Paz, there was a family a large family who was actively serving in the church. And uh, they didn't have a car to get to church. And one of the brothers there realized how much they were struggling to get to church. And he came and said, you know what, guys? I have a car, and I'm going to give it to you. And he handed them the keys of his car. And it was his beloved Mustang that he had as a young man. And, and he loved it and polished it and everything else. But it was always sitting in his garage. And this family needed a car. So he said, here, take this car. He said, whenever you can pay me, you'll pay me back. If you can. If you can't, don't sweat it. Don't worry about it. And this family couldn't believe their eyes. I couldn't believe my eyes. And they had that car. A few weeks later, another brother from the church is like, hey, you got a nice car. And he sees the tires are so worn out that you could virtually see the air in those things, like all the wires out. And this brother says to this family, hey, I'll meet you at the tire shop tomorrow noon because I want to give you the four set of tires. And another person at church did that for that family. And it's, it, it was not a, a bragging thing. It was, it was nothing. It was just out of sheer love. 
sheer confidence. God has done so much for me. We are God's family. We are his family. He's called you to make the difference in this selfish world, in this individualistic world. God has called you to be the salt of the earth. That is why Paul tells them on verse 2, Oh, we give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith. Because faith has to be shown in our works. Just like what I'm telling you. We were driving from BC, started on Saturday, and from Calgary to Saskatoon, our car decided that the alternator was old enough and it died. So the, the dashboard started like a Christmas tree, ding, 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 lights everywhere. And you can imagine a Mexican driving in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> cold, the car stalls, and I don't know what to do. What do people do in the middle of Calgary and Saskatoon? And wherever you look, there's nothing. <laughs> nothing, literally. I, I mean, we saw that uh, tumbleweed going on. <laughs> we did. We did. I'm like, what are we going to do? And I phoned uh, our president, Brian Rushton. I said, Brian, you know everybody in this country. <laughs> what do we do when we're in this situation? He said, oh, there's nothing you can do. What is the problem? Oh, I think it's the alternator. He said, you know what? Uh, I'll get Marcel, another friend, and uh, we'll get an alternator, some tools, and we'll drive and get you. It was a three-hour drive. The man, uh, he has a lot of health issues. He can't stand being sitting for a long time or standing for a long time because he's in a lot of pain. And he took the three-hour drive to rescue me while I was freezing to death and, uh, and help me replace the alternator and then drive back all the way to Saskatoon. I lost the whole afternoon that he was with his family and everything just to rescue this couple Mexican <laughs> stranded there. Who does those things? Most people would say, call a towing company and get into somewhere. I don't know. I said, Brian, thank you so much. I said, that's what family does. We are family. We are the family of God. Faith must be seen in our works. You know the people who you don't see who makes possible that we're here so comfortable and that there's sound sounding on the speakers and, and the church is clean and so many things. You are the church. What are you doing? God has his way of pushing us into things. These disciples were pushed into missions by persecution, but I guarantee you it's much better when we do it willingly than pushed in persecution. Listen to me, you are the church. You are the body of Christ. Do you know what Paul was thankful for and what he remembered about the church in Thessalonica? Something that you and I can work on. Look at verse 3. Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. He mentions three things. The work of faith, the labor of your love, the steadfastness of hope. What is the work of faith? The labor of your love and the steadfastness of hope. And I was, while I was telling you all these stories and things that I was able to see uh, in the church in Mexico, and I've seen it in other churches, Paul connects this little verse here with a better, uh, uh, in a better way on verse 9, because there are three parallels that I, I want you to see. The work of their faith, how they turned from idols to God. That was radical. It's not just words, it's actions. The work of their love by serving the true living God. The steadfastness in hope with the second coming of Jesus. We're in the middle of a lot of things, but you know what? This is not the end. We're sojourners. 
Oh, the Lord is coming for us. We have to keep our eyes in his kingdom. Say like, yeah, God, we're here this while. I don't know how long I'm going to be here. Maybe another hour, maybe another 50 years. I don't know. But he's got me here for a reason. What am I going to do that time? How is what God has given me and the gifting he has given me better used for his kingdom? That has to lead our decisions. So let me break it really quick so that it's clear for us. James says that if you have faith but you have no works, your faith is dead. And he puts it very practical, you know, in a practical sense, helping those in need and, and, and practical assistance. Just like what I was telling you about. Uh, but Paul connects it to a real response reflected in the decisions that you make as you live. Now in the case of these Thessalonians, they put aside the idols, they put aside the ancestral practices, they put aside their own preconceptions, which in our own terms would mean stop living according to the world, stop following the trends of this world and what people's talking about and what they do and what they say, ah, everybody does it. I don't care about that. I am a born again person with a different destiny. Every choice you make, every decision, every thought, every conversation you have, a reflection of who God is in you. Let me ask you another question. I'm very inquisitive tonight. <laughs> Did you surrender your life to Jesus? Have you done that? Did you say, Lord Jesus, my life belongs to you. I am yours. Have you said that? If you answer yes, guess what? You are no longer yours. You belong to God. You belong to God. Then why do we keep thinking about ourselves? The work of your faith is more than giving money to missions or putting money in the basket at church or coming to church on Sundays. It is making it clear that you are no longer what you used to be. That you no longer enjoy watching movies that are not appropriate. That you no longer feel comfortable listening to, to rude jokes and comments that you can no longer talk to, to your high school friends with that kind of language. Did you know that there are so many young Christians that are just afraid of being Christians in their schools because of the pressure they get from their peers? So they entertain activities that they know God displeases and they just do it anyways because they don't want to feel rejected. And for those of you that are still in that stage in life, you are no longer part of that group. You're part of a much bigger family. What a difference it makes when you're the young lady that your friends see who doesn't speak with foul language and is not afraid of standing up for what you believe in. What a difference does it make when Mrs. So-and-so is talking to you and you don't entertain gossip or things like that. Your friends are thirsty to have a friend who shows integrity and stands for what he believes in. I guarantee you that far from losing their friendship, you'll gain their respect, their recognition, their admiration. Because they're suffering from very bad things and you can be there to help them and introduce your God and this amazing salvation to those people, whether it's school, whether it's the marketplace, wherever God places you. Number two, the work of your love. Did you know loving hurts? <laughs> it, it does, doesn't it? 20 years ago, my wife was praying, Father, give me love for the people. When you're planting a church and you have the church living in your fridge as they're coming to your house you know, on a daily basis, you pray those things. Please give me love for the people. 
And my wife loves to say that she had this thought, do you really want to love them? Because love hurts. It does. Clearly, love is not something easy. It's not a feeling that it's given to you. It is a determination to give yourself in favor of the other person. That's why Paul writes, the work of your love. We have to work at it. Do you remember what John 3.16 says? For God, what? For God so loved the world. How did God show his love for you and me? He gave himself, he gave his only son for us, willingly. Jesus gave his life so that you and I can have life in him. Eternal life, to be reconciled to God forever. What does our labor of love look like? Paul puts it as a service to God. People think that service to God is doing church or something at church. is part of that. But it's also serving your spouse. It's also living for her, living for him. It's also serving God. When you serve your brothers and sisters, you are serving God. When you're sacrificially giving yourself for others, you are serving God. When you help the lady in the supermarket carrying the grocery to her car, you are serving God. When you're being patient with the person at customer service who's not paying attention to you and you've been there forever and you start making noises and ah. Uh, there's four stands and only one person. When you stop doing that and you start standing on the other person's shoes and saying, whoa, she must be having a hard time being alone, helping a lot of angry customers. Wow, I'll better put a smile for her and say, it's okay. I have time for you. Whoa, are you weird? <laughs> What's wrong with you? Oh, let me tell you. God was patient with me. I did much worse to him. Jesus explained it this way. Come you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Wow. You realize the dimension of God's love? The work of your faith, the work of your love. Number three, the steadfastness in the hope of our Lord Jesus Christ. To be steadfast is to persevere in the doctrine and the teaching of our Lord Jesus. To keep the hope that God has given us. If you have ever been sad and depressed and discouraged and disheartened and anxious, do you know why? I'll give you the answer to that. The answer of millennia. I'll tell you why. <laughs> it's not because I'm smart. It's because I read this book. <laughs> Hold on to your chair. <laughs> the reason is because we have our eyes in this life. You would truly want to get depressed, watch every news, read the newspaper on a daily basis basis start thinking about this life as the only thing that there is and that there is no hope that everything ends here that there is no future no emotion there is nothing but a regretful acceptance of it is what it is and living day by day by day with what you have to live and that is the way to depression and sadness and anxiety and despair. And if that weren't enough, a temper that no one can stand. 
<laughs> Steadfastness in the hope of our Lord Jesus obeys to something greater, much greater. Paul writes to the Philippians, do not be anxious about anything. In everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made and known by God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Why the peace that surpasses all understanding? Because it is rooted in trust in God. How can you have peace when you see the condition of this world? Ah, because God has shown his faithfulness. He said he would come and he did. He said he would rise on the third day. And guess what? He did. He said he'll come back and he goes, what? He's coming back. He'll do it. He has demonstrated it once and again and again. He is God. So that we can have a future, a perfect life of harmony and peace and love because he will come. That is trust in a God who has proven to fulfill his word. That is why you can have peace. That is why abiding in the hope of Christ guards our hearts and our thoughts. That's why you can have peace when sickness invades your home or when there are work cuts and, or, or when your kids get in trouble or when you get a horrible diagnosis or when your parents die or problems in your marriage because you know that that's not the end of the story. It's not the end of the story. God, the God who loves you so much to come and die for you and me, he has not finished the work. Oh no, no. He will fulfill his word. Jesus said it clearly. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little. And the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live. You will also live. So today. Our Lord's exhortation is that we live as God's chosen church with the works of faith the labor of her love and the steadfastness in hope of christ i hope as we hear these words in the bible that we are encouraged to be sent to fulfill the reason why he sent us and he saved us amen would you stand up for closing prayer with me Heavenly Father, what an amazing joy to be standing together before you. What an undeserved gift it is to have your salvation, to be indwelled by your Holy Spirit, to become children of God. We praise your name. We give you glory for that. And we pray tonight that you will allow us to be a reflection of who you are to this world who so desperately needs you. You have placed us in various different families with many different variables, different problems, different challenges, different joys. Oh God, may each one of us be those ambassadors from you that will be able to to preach through our lives what it means to be a Christian, a follower of Christ. May your name be glorified in our lives and may your kingdom be enlarged among all of those whom you've come our way. Thank you, Father, for your glorious. Thank you for your faithfulness that we can trust you and that we can rest in who you are. Bless this church, I pray. Bless these brothers and sisters as they embark to fulfill your calling on their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you.